A few weeks ago, I mentioned I was working on a video about auction estimates and uh, how accurate are they, where do they generally come out and all this. And as I delved into it, I realized this is a very complicated subject because I ran an auction house for 20 years and, I, and I've been into hundreds of thousands of auctions and uh, sold and, and, and done things in New York and uh, with, with the bigger auction houses. So I'm pretty familiar with it. With it and I understand their, as, a, as, a, as an auctioneer, I understand what their uh, psychology is. And uh, the, the simple fact of the matter is, is that most people consigning to an auction house don't understand any of it. Even people who have been collecting for quite a while, maybe even dealing for quite a while. Sometimes dealers are the worst consigners an auction house can possibly have because they have such un delusional expectations and they're afraid of losing a little bit of money. Uh, so they want everything protected. And because they want all that protection, the thing doesn't sell because they got the estimates too high. There's a lot of things that go into it because the number one goal of any smart auctioneer, any auctioneer worth his salt has one goal and that is to understand human nature as much as possible and to get bidders committed to buying an object and then take the next step to place bids to bid as soon as possible. And that's either online or with left bids or the day of the auction in the room. You want to get hands in the air as quickly as possible and where what the estimates are can dictate how well that works. The lower the estimates, the lower the reserves, the more activity you're going to get right off the bat. The more activity you get right off the bat, the higher you're likely to go beyond the estimate. And that's really, that's about it. All right. And to getting the word out today uh, for auctioneers, even smaller auctioneers has really never been easier, provided they have a good reputation. They understand what potential bidders want and then just giving it to them. And this can be done quite easily, no matter where they are in the world. It doesn't make any difference any world, the world anymore. The world has gotten really, really small. All right. And the, the key is always lots of photos. All right. And I, and I still see auction houses that go through all this work to put up things. So they put up one photo of the object, um, which is really dumb and lazy. And they're not doing themselves any favor. And they're not doing their consigners any favor. And they're not doing their reputations any favors. Lots of photos, top, front, back, and bottom. Um, live auctioneers and value. All these auction houses allow you to do pretty much as many pictures as you want. And uh, I cannot understand for the life of me why companies don't do that. Because they're going to end up sending the photos out through requests for the people that are interested but they're going to lose a lot of people because they're going to say, ah, I don't want to bother chasing it. You want to draw those people in. You want to draw people in to come and bid at your auction. All right. And then you also need to provide reasonable shipping options and answering bidder inquiries quickly and clearly. All right. And, and the auction houses I've noticed that provide shipping, in-house shipping, uh, are way ahead of the game on, on this scale here, on this deal. Um, if they offer in-house shipping, you can communicate with them. They'll send you back uh, uh, a quick estimate on what it'll be so you know everything going in. And you don't have to worry about calling uh, the auction house to get the name of the UPS store and arranging to get it picked up and all that. Those are all obstacles. A smart auction house today removes obstacles. And I'm amazed that more auctioneers haven't set up shipping programs that they can run themselves. That It could, it could be a slight profit center and will raise their prices as, uh, exponentially. Um, in their sales if they help provide shipping because the, the buyer doesn't feel like they have to go out searching for someone to come get their stuff and get it to them. It's too many steps. All right. But the typical bidder psychology is, is, is pretty fascinating thing. All right. Because it's, bidders go through a conversion. First, you have a potential bidder who's interested in something, but he has no skin in the game. He's on the potential bidder side of the fence, potential bidder. Once his first bid is made though, um, they're starting to cross over to the other side that they're thinking of it as something that they own. Some, a, a, a sense of ownership is sort of falls upon them after they've placed a couple of bids. And as, as time nears the auction or as the auction bidding increases, their desire to keep it starts to, to go. And this is a crucial spot after the first bid. A, that slight sense of ownership has sunk in. And now they're in the, on the other side of the fence and they're starting to view themselves as, well, this is mine. I'm, I own this. And that is, that is the sweet spot where people will start to really chase things and, 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 and bid up and push numbers, uh, f often far beyond what they'd planned to see, um, to pay. I had, I, as an auctioneer, I had many cases where the guy will say, well, I'm not going to pay more than 10,000 for that. And they check out, they're checking out and they paid 25,000 for it. And they said, well, I, I went crazy. I guess I had to have it. All right. And that's, that's where, that's where you want people to be, uh, in, in, in auction houses. If you look around, well, the bidding is going on on a major lot 
even among the pros, you watch them, watch their breathing, their, their, their chest is heaving, their hands are shaking a little bit because the adrenaline is flowing, the heart rate is increasing, and they feel like they're in a fight. They feel like they're defending their property to keep it. And those, that's when the emotions take over. And people say, well, that doesn't happen. People are, there, are, there are people who are dispassionate buyers. They're just, to them, it's uh, we could just purely transactional. They have a price, they wrote it down, they're going to sell it for X, and that's it. And if they don't get it, they don't get it. And that's it. But those are not the majority of the potential bidders out there when you're handling good objects. All right. And it's a, a dealer also as a collector themselves. They have a very high chance of uh, falling onto the side of behaving more like collectors than like dealers because they, they start out thinking, well, I'll put it in inventory to sell it. And then as the bidding progresses, they begin to realize, I really like that. I may just keep it. And as soon as they decide they may just keep it, dealers will will spend quite a bit of money to get something uh, because they know they can they have an easier way to sell it if they decide to down the road, and psychologically they can rationalize it. And these are, these are the types of dynamics that auction houses want to create. And you this kind of theater um, you'll you'll you 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 can only get to by getting participants involved. People sitting on the sidelines. Thinking about it, gonna no. You want everybody to, to bid. I, I can tell you from uh, from attending many many auctions and seeing this happen, and and having auctions on my own. Um, sometimes we would have an, a lot come up, and we, we you know we know it's going to bring ten or fifteen thousand dollars. You start it out, and you say, how about a thousand, and nobody bids, and you're throwing it out for a thousand dollars. It's going to bring ten or fifteen. No hands go up in the air. So what do you do? <clears throat> if you don't have a reserve on the piece, you drop the bidding down to a hundred bucks. And suddenly every hand in the room goes up in the air. They're all up there. They're all hanging their hands up in the air. And what happens? You begin to sort of just run across all those hands and go 100, 300, 500, 1,000, and so forth. And you get there very, very, very quickly. Um, and, 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 and that is because everybody's willing to pay 100 bucks for it. The other idea is that, is that if, you, if you're not getting any action on it, you start to imply that you're going to pass it, and suddenly all the hands go up in the air when you drop the bid a little bit. There's all kinds of little psychological games that you can play as an auctioneer to get people to come in, participate, let's go. Um, and they all come down to these two terms that we hear all the time, estimates and reserves. All right. And, and do they affect selling prices? Can they encourage or discourage participation by certain bidders? Yeah, they sure can. Um, are they, are they, uh, 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 does it happen all the time? Yeah, it happens most of the time. All right. Estimates are simply uh, a meeting of the minds between the seller and the um, uh, auction house. That's all it is. It's a it's a published estimation of value that's been agreed to by the seller and and the auctioneer um, with the auctioneer thinking in the mind of a buyer saying uh, bidders will come in at this price. And the, the seller says, I'm willing to sell it at that price if this is what it comes down to. All right. And reserves are simply the minimum selling price below which the auctioneer agrees he won't let the item go. And that item, uh, that uh, reserve can't be any higher than the low estimate. And uh, some auctions, are they have estimates, but the pieces are unreserved. And they often say so right in the listing. This is an unreserved lot. As we've seen many times, unreserved lots do awfully well much of the time uh, because people realize they have a clean shot at it. And a lot of people become committed. They think they can buy it. And uh, suddenly the, the piece that was estimated there were a number of unreserved lots in the, one of the last Christie sales. They were estimated at three to five thousand dollar no reserve, and they brought ten thousand. All right, that's the, that's the power of having no reserves. All right, um, and are they typically accurate? No. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, estimates are off uh, much more often than they are right. They're they're, they're in the. And I'm going to go through some numbers later on, and I'm going to you're going to see just how inaccurate they are relative to the final selling price. Um, they almost bear no resemblance to it much of the time. Um, uh, it's, it's just part of the, part of the deal. Um, do, do they affect selling prices and bidder, bidder participation reserves? Yeah, but not in the reasons you might think. Estimates do not increase results by being high. And there are people that think that, people that are naive, that are, are maybe selling for the first time, or they've only been auction buyers most of their life, and they've built up a collection. And now when they're going to sell, they want very, very high estimates. They want big estimates on everything, not understanding their own psychology when they were buying as collectors. They may have paid much more than the estimate, but they would often skip on things that seemed to have high estimates. But they would go after things that had modest or reasonable estimates to get started. Started. And once they got into it, then they go beyond what they were thinking. And they don't want to, they don't have that same viewpoint as sellers. And they forget that. 
They need to remember that. They need to remember what drove me to spend $30,000 on something that was estimated at 8 to 12. All right. If you estimate it now at, at 30,000 or 40,000 or 50,000, is that going to discourage people? And I can dare and guarantee you it will. It will discourage people to be an auction seller. You have to have a little courage and a little faith in the efficiency of the auction market. All right. And uh, in, in, in the end, uh, auction estimates historically have little to do with end results. Estimates can provide encouragement and they can provide some comfort um, uh, to inexperienced collectors or new collectors. Um, it's sort of a crutch to get them sort of into the game a little bit. But they don't understand that the chances of it selling for within that estimated range um, is is about about one in five, uh, pretty close to it most of the time. One, one out of four times, one out of five times, it'll sell in that estimate. Generally, it goes above it. All right. And that's that is the, that is the statistic uh, on it. It isn't true in all categories of auctions. Um, if you're peddling Rolex watches, uh, things that are manufactured that have very consistent um, um, appearances and there's not a lot of art involved. They're just flashy, expensive things. Um, estimates are easy to come to. But when you're dealing in art, things that are the creative nature, things that inspire people, um, um, uh, it's <laughs> it's a wild card situation. And um, uh, you can be discouraged or you can be um, uh, uh, very pleased with your results at an auction. But it, it has to do with the beauty of the object, the uniqueness of the object. And in the end, that beauty is the only thing that matters to create demand um, and also historic aspects, historic rarity, provenance and all that, of course, comes into play. Um, but they can encourage and discourage buyers. Um, and, and most of the time, reserves are uh, uh, if, to a smart seller. Um, he will ask for a, a lower estimates um, because if he wants a reserve, he wants the, the reserve down so low that uh it's not going to discourage anyone. You don't want to discourage people. Unreserved auctions of good things bring the most money most of the time. If you go to an auction where there are no reserves, um, absolutely none, you'll see crowds of people, mobs of people because greed has kicked in and they're all showing up for it. All right. And um, this this is this is a really good thing. Um, we we I remember auctions. We have four or five hundred people would show up for an auction because it was unreserved, a good estate. And the prices were through the ball right through the roof. And uh, people would ask, what, what are your reserves? Hey, we don't have any reserves. And that that's like that's that's like chumming for sharks. OK, uh, they just go wild. And it's really what it is. But strangely, uh, sellers, when, when it comes down to selling their own collections, forget all of this. They forget what got them to pay so much money for something. Why they why they went to the auction and, and they, the auctioneer said, well, we think it'll bring eight to ten thousand. And this person ended up spending thirty. All right. If they had, if the auctioneer had told them the estimates, the estimate was thirty to forty thousand. Would it be bid? Probably not. Probably not. He would have thought, well, there's no chance at a bargain because people like to acquire things for their collections, but they also like to uh, 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 justify the purchase a little bit in their head by getting a uh, by getting a bargain. And thinking the perception of a bargain is a powerful motivator, even if it's not at all likely. All right, because of the efficiency of the market, the auction market is fantastically efficient. All right, and um, but. This is this is what happens. And also collectors, when they go to sell their collections, they want high estimates because they one, they don't want any risk. They want that protection and they want validation for their collection decisions over the years by pushing high estimates in reserve, believing illogically that this strategy will work because I thought it was wonderful. And I put it in my collection. It's now no longer a, a, a moderately priced thing. It's worth more because I owned it and I coveted it and I loved it. And there we go. And we have to uh, get this, uh, you know, get this top price. All right. And often the prices are just detached from reality. And uh, we see this often in the, in the antique and art market, people will come in and make it when I can sign something and they've got some crazy number in their head, you know, uh, because they saw one sort of like it that sold for a lot of money, not understanding all of the dynamics that drove to that price and saying, well, that's what I want. Well, in, in the auctioneers, sometimes we'll take it on a shot just in case they, they hate to turn away a, a possible profit, but nine times out of 10, it doesn't work out for them. And they end up giving it, doing a lot of advertising and photographs and so forth, and then just giving it back to the uh, consigner when it's over. And now the consigner may even have to pay them a buy-in premium, which is a, a buy-in commission. If it doesn't sell, you have to give the auctioneer something for his effort. All right. At any rate, 
there are numbers of uh, different types of collectors out there and people, and uh, there are people who regularly buy and sell at auctions. Uh, the best, um, the best uh, consigners, generally speaking, are um, um, auctioneers themselves who buy and sell at other auctions because there are many that do that. I've known many, many, many of them over the years that when they're not doing their own auctions, they're out buying things at other auctions and then um, or maybe reconsigning them to an auction that does a little better job or an auction house that has better visibility and so forth. And uh, the, the, the next best uh, consigners really, um, and you can, any auction house will tell you this, generally are executors of estates um, that are not related to the person whose estate is being sold. All right. To them, again, it's a transactional thing and they will generally rely on the expertise of the auctioneer to guide them. And these kinds of estates, you'd often see extraordinary results extraordinary results because they allow the auction house to take control of it. And if they're a good auction house, they'll do a good job. And experienced auctioneers understand the auction market. They understand the dynamic and the ability to reveal current value. So when an auctioneer puts something in auction, he's generally the easiest consigner you'll ever get. Um, he, he understands the market. He's not apprehensive about how it works. He understands the dynamic of the market, and he'll put things in auctions, um, um, not demanding high high estimates and high reserves, but low estimates and low reserves, because they understand their own psychology, because they live in both worlds all the time, as buyers and as sellers, and as in intermediaries between buyers and sellers. They're your best ones. Uh, dealers who rarely b sell at auction are terrible consigners um, in general uh, because they have prices in their heads that just aren't realistic. Uh, they buy at auction all the time, but they don't sell at auction all the time. And people, human nature allows them to, to elevate prices in their minds um, beyond rational uh, beyond rational levels. So uh, sometimes when when you when you see uh, a bunch of lots on an auction and they're all passing and they're all really good things, you wonder what happened. Well, you find out later that it belonged to a dealer that was trying to clean out his inventory and a lot of the people that came to the auction recognized it as so-and-so's inventory he's you know the, the estimate and the reserves are what he was asking in his shop and it just tanks and it's a disaster and uh, nobody makes any money on it it's just a waste of time and uh, then the next worst kind of uh, executor are family members who believed everything that uncle joe or grandpa fred told them about their collection um, which is often devoid from reality um, lots of collections get left to people um, and the, the the collector has 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 at, at christmas and thanksgiving told wild tales of how rare their things are and what they're worth and and over the years they just keep raising the numbers in their heads and uh, there's there's no basis for any of it but the executor believed everything. This is all they know about the collection. They loved their grandfather. They loved their dad, whoever whoever bought the collection. And they be become real sticks in the mud when it comes to selling. And often they get clobbered and then they say, oh, it's the auctioneer's fault. All right. But one of the things I wanted to get into quickly and to go through some of the numbers and give you some idea how inaccurate auction estimates are. All right. And, I, and I'm not picking on these companies because these companies actually, um, I'm going to talk about Christie's and Sotheby's. Christie's and Sotheby's are among the auction houses and bottoms are among the most accurate in the business. <clears throat> okay. They're at the top of the food chain. They, they have enormous resources. They have uh, uh, enormous talent. They have lots of places to look to garner information about items that may come into them. They do the research. And um, now they have this great object. And now they have this, the consigner or the lawyer for the estate sitting in front of them. And they need them to come to some sort of meeting of the minds in order to put the thing in an auction and try to, their best to get it sold. All right. And here's an interesting statistic. In the one sale I looked at, it wasn't. This was fairly recent. Um, Christie's had a. Uh, I took 134 lots out of the sale. I didn't do every lot in the sale, but I went through it, just sort of grabbed this lot, this lot, this lot, this lot, and uh, just to get a ballpark. All right. And uh, of the 134 lots, 34 of them sold with an estimate, so that roughly 25% sold for what they had been estimated for. 56% sold for overestimate. All right. 20%, 19% sold below estimate or didn't sell at all, were bought in um, with, with heavy reserves, all right? And beyond that, the other aspect that's sort of interesting is that about 13% sold for tw two times or more of the estimate, 
and about another 11% sold for um, um, uh, uh, more than three times the estimate. So, in other words, uh, uh, 24% of that sale, a quarter of it, sold for at least two times estimate, and uh, about half that number sold for three times estimate. All right, so there you are. Those are those those are your numbers. All right, so it's a basically two to one sell for overestimate. And then I looked at the Sotheby's sale, sort of from the same time period, and uh, what did I see? I looked at 162 lots over there, and in the end, it came out to about the same. Um, uh, only about 19% sold within estimate. Christie's was at 25%, and this can vary up and down. This is not. This is no way criticizing them. I mean, it, 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 because the estimate and reserves are part of a balancing act that they're trying to run between the sellers and the buyers to feed the market and to get things sold. So you always have to keep that in mind. All right. The number that sold for overestimate, 53%, almost the same as exactly the same as Christie's sold below estimate or bought in um, was about 28%, a little bit higher there. They took some, they apparently took some fairly high estimates from people or reserves. They may have had to fill out the sales. That's also part of the problem is that they'll have, you know, they're close to having enough to run a sale and they've got to take a few lots. Maybe they wouldn't otherwise, or it was tied to another consignment. Sometimes the auction houses will have somebody will come in with, with, with 10 phenomenal things. And then they'll have three or four things that the, the auction house isn't that crazy about. And they'll accept them even with high estimates in order to get the other things to sell. All right. It's a business and it's, it's, it, this isn't any sort of scheme. It's just, it's just the business and they have to make a decision on it, which is perfectly reasonable. Now at, 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 at uh, 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 Sotheby's this time around, 37% sold for twice the estimate, all right, and 12% for th sold for three or more times the estimate. So, so roughly about 49% uh, uh, sold for almost of that 53% that sold over estimate. Um, about a big percentage of it, almost 40 something percent, sold for two or more times the estimate. All right, and that's because that is just the nature of who they were dealing with. So how do they, how do the auction houses come up with the estimates to coax, coax the sellers? Well, it's sort of an interesting thing. Um, uh, for example, they, they, they may, they may, the first step may be just examining their auction proposed um, that they're being uh, offered, and the auctioneer will often ask, well, what the seller, what are you expecting for the thing? If they're experienced sellers, they, they'll have that conversation. What do you think it's worth? Especially if it's a collector or a dealer that they know well and is, is not crazy, all right? Or they may simply say, we examined your painting or the, your sculpture or whatever it is, and based on similar work sold during the last uh, 10 years, we feel this is a reasonable expectation. And the estimate, more often than not, is lower than the price will sell for, as we've just seen, um, but not so low that it sends potential uh, seller running to the door with his or her property and not so uh, not high enough to discourage participation because the, the lower the estimates, the lower the reserves, the greater the participation and the more of a sort of a, 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 a mob pursuit begins. And you want that mob pursuit. You want hands all over the room. Um, there's nothing sadder for an auctioneer to have an, a lot come up with a big estimate and he sees it in front of him. It's got a big reserve on it and he looks out into the room and he says, um, you know, starting bid, you know, 500,000. There's not a, is, 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 there's not any interest at all. Nobody lifts a hand. Now he has to go down, dig down and start at a much lower number and then play his reserve off the person sitting in the room, getting them up to that 500,000 or 400,000 or whatever the reserve is. And that's a slog. It's disappointing. And it, and it also dampens enthusiasm for the entire sale. In many cases, people begin to look at it and go, oh, everything's got high reserves. And, and that is not a good formula for an auction. All right. Bu buyers, bu bu buyers like reading tea leaves. So they, uh, they like to look at reserves and things like that and try to speculate uh, what the estimate is, you know, take a look at the estimate and try to speculate what the reserve is and all that. And these are all priced drivers that, that they have to take into, into account. Um, and then there are other things that drive value, um, uh, uh, comparative other relative auction results. Maybe the piece is, maybe this piece is sold um, at, at one of the auction houses, uh, one of the big auction houses or a smaller auction house five, 10, 15 years ago, and they can go back and look that up. And then the rarity of, of the piece, is it rare? Is it historical? That can have some impact. And then of course, the magic combination for an object is that it is visually superior. It's not an unattractive piece. It's a beautiful example. 
and it has historically uh, uh, has a historic significance to it. Came from a famous collection. It has to do with a famous historical event. Um, it was it was commissioned by a, a certain person. All these things provided the piece is outstanding looking. All right, this is the big thing. You know, people think, well, it belonged to so and so. Well, unless so and so was President, you know, George Washington or something, nobody's going to really care. <clears throat> the the famous person ownership angle um, outside of some celebrity auctions and stuff like that um, the first time around doesn't have much impact on the value of something. If somebody owned it who was a historic or quasi historic figure four or 500 years ago or 300 or 200 years ago, um, if it's not one of the really, really big players in American history or European history, a king, a president, um, uh, or maybe a very, very famous general in some cases, uh, provenance like that historic historic aspects don't impact value too much. All right. It just it just doesn't. Um, if it's if it's however, if it's uh, a, a, a celebrity item the first time around at at a major auction house, uh, for example, the, the famous Jackie O sale um, where they got, you know, four thousand dollars for a Kmart plastic trash bin that was in her powder room, um, which today, of course, it's worth nothing. It's, it's if you went to sell that that plastic trash bin today that somebody paid $5,000 for back in the nineties, you'd be lucky to get a hundred bucks for it. Nobody cares. People got caught up in the emotion of that auction. So the, the estimates were blown to bits. Everything sold brought a lot of money. And we've seen this many, many times in celebrity auctions. Uh, Andy Warhol's famous cookie jar collection. Um, they've been, uh, people paid thousands of dollars for these uh, inexpensive cookie jars that Andy Warhol collected. And uh, they did very well at his estate auction because it was a social thing. It was another dynamic that came into play. The estimates were low and people went crazy to own something that belonged to Andy Warhol. But today, those cookie jars are probably worth 20 cents on the dollar to what was paid for them 30 years later, even though some people paid thousands of dollars for them. Again, the psychology of the market. And this is something consigners um, who aren't experienced consigners often don't understand. And um, rarely sold uh, uh, items can do very, very well, provided um, there's there's some way to link it to something interesting, uh, or if it's if if something has been off the market. I remember a few years ago there was an auction in France where they had a. Uh, uh, a bronze that came up, and the last time it was sold was the, the Drouot in, uh, I think it was 1918 or something. And the thing went through the roof. It went crazy, all right? And then you'll have auctions of great things, and not too dissimilar from that object, but they turn up every five or ten years in the auction, and they're known around the trade as sort of um, just trade goods, things that are coming and going. If you don't buy it this time, you'll catch it the next time around like a Ferris, like a merry-go-round. you just, okay, I didn't, I didn't get it this time. Maybe next time I'll get it. All right. Now, the things that uh, uh, drive uh, estimates and prices are, of course, condition, size, that sort of thing. Um, and then are there institutional examples? Are there, are there museums that have very, very similar pieces? Are there, uh, has this piece been exhibited? Has the piece, has it been exhibited in, in a particular museum? Has it been on tour? Has it been in, published in books and all that? And, and then you have, of course, um, uh, the provenance. Has it been held within a family for a very, very long time? Or is it one of these perennial pieces that turns up in, in with you know six seven times since 1980 in the auction market? All of those things have a lot to do with it. And then of course, is it is it is it is it trade inventories that are being sold and published that way? Um, it, it, how's it going to do? All right. And, the, and these are all elements that go into coming up with estimates. All right. These are all the factors that play into it. And the, the major thing is not to have estimates so high that it kills the stuff. OK, um, demand um, um, uh, is indicated by the collector base that's out there. Um, there are things that were very valuable back uh, 20, 30 years ago that have plummeted in, in value. American furniture has plummeted in value. Um, compared to what it was worth 20 years ago. Japanese uh, ceramics have plummeted in value. All right, so the market could go up and down. And in today's market, you have lots of people out there that own things that were bought back in the 90s, and they can't get their heads around the idea that it may only be worth half what they paid for it back then because the market has shifted. And uh, if you're in that trap, you're in a lot of trouble, and you're probably not going to get out of it um, until until uh, you have a sort of come to Jesus moment and realize that, okay, I bought it, I enjoyed it, I'm going to take the loss and move on. 
And that's why you see Japanese sales today with very large buy-in rates. You see 50% unsold. And the reason 50% were unsold was <laughs> um, the people are into them for too much money and they can't bring themselves around to believing that the things haven't gone up at all in 20 years. Um, and that is, but that is the nature of the art and auction market. And it's happened in every category that I can think of. And I think uh, right now, Chinese art is going through a little bumpy patch here. You're going to see some collections coming into the market and you're going to see collections coming into the market that great amounts of money were paid for back in 2008, 9, 10, 11, and 12, 13, back then, 10 years ago. Those prices aren't there anymore. It's not, those are not reasonable expectations and certainly not a profit on much of it. All right. It's just the cycle of the industry. There's nothing wrong with the things. They're the same objects they always were. Um, the smart money right now, I would suspect, is buying Japanese art, is buying um, um, other forms of art that are sort of on the outs um, if they're thinking of it from a financial standpoint, because eventually it will cycle around and come back. And you just have to live long enough for that to happen. But the bottom line is, is that estimates are a way to link buyers to sellers and sellers to buyers. And you need them to be placed in that sweet spot that isn't so low that it freaks out the seller and isn't so high that it scares off your buyers. All right. And if you look through, you're going to see what I, those statistics I gave are pretty consistent um, in many, many, many cases. And it's not that estimates are intended to be accurate. They are intended to provide a platform or a base where, where the seller and the bidders can meet to begin the process of finding the piece a new owner. And that's what it's all about. And uh, that's, I hope you find that interesting. It's a very fascinating topic. There's a lot of psychology in it. Uh, it's not uh, some simple thing. And uh, the, 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 and I stand by the, I, one guy said to me one time, he said, if an auction house runs an entire sale and is accurate, high or low, 10% below estimate, 10% above estimate across the board through his sale, he's the sharpest dealer in the world because no auction house has ever done it on a large auction. It's never been done that I'm aware of. Um, every one of them has their moments or their surprises and so forth. And I'm going to go through a couple of lots um, to, to sort of illustrate what I'm talking about here. And I'm going to start with this one because this is one of the greatest examples of a missed estimate that I've ever seen. You, some of you may remember this. This is the russet jade carving of a pig dragon that was in the Irving sale a few years ago, uh, back in 2019. And it was estimated at five to 7,000 U.S., sold for 2.295 million, all right? Now, the reason was um, uh, Christie's looked at it and they weren't sure about it. The provenance, it had come from, uh, here you have it, it came from uh, Penseng Antiques in Bangkok, Thailand in 1990. It wasn't bought that long ago, just 20, 29, at the time it was sold, 29 years earlier by Mr. Irving, who was a very advanced collector. Um, they didn't have any documents on the piece, and apparently Christie's didn't have any comps to compare it to. They didn't know what to do. The estate was handling it, They're probably a lawyer, and they said, well, put it up, put an estimate you feel comfortable with and sell it. And again, here you have the case of the efficiency of the market coming in. Obviously, several people recognize what this is. As I recall, there were several bidders up to well over a million dollars on this thing. It jumped very, very rapidly because there were people in the room, even though Christie's maybe couldn't find the comp, couldn't verify its age, people in the room sure did. Uh, because you don't get into 2.295 million from a $5,000 estimate unless there's an enormous amount of certainty of the authenticity of the piece. Probably examples in the Palace Museum or the National Palace Museum or some collection. Um, there are some very sharp gentlemen, especially in China, on jades. Um, and uh, their, sense, their sense and ability to spot authentic pieces is pretty astonishing. And that happened in this case. That's what that was. All right. And then we come over here. We're going to look at a few fairly recent examples. Some of you will recognize this. You had the uh, Zetan birdcage, and we talked about it quite a bit. And I, at the time, we said, yeah, 70 to 100,000. The guy was a very famous birdcage maker um, in 1919, dated. What's it going to bring? Well, they don't come on the market that often. They're exceedingly rare. It's a beautiful object. And uh, apparently, a lot of people out there love birdcages. And it nearly doubled its high estimate. All right, went for $189,000. And then you had this. I've talked about this a few times. I'm showing it again just because I liked it so much. Uh, it is a beautiful um, a, a 17th, early 18th century faceted jar. Um, it was sold by Jim Lally. It was estimated at 30 to 50,000, sold for 98,000. 
then you had this. And I don't know how many of you remember this piece, but this was a, a, a river of color. Um, this was the Cloisonne enamel auction that Christie's did a few years ago from private American collections. And it had an enormous write-up, as you can see, 15 to 16th century. It was estimated at three to 500,000 U.S. dollars, sold for 2,629,000, way overestimate. Way overestimate. Did they know it would bring that? They probably suspected it. But if they had set the estimate at 1.5 to 2 million, it may not have sold at all. They may have scared off enough people that they didn't bother chasing it. You need to get people in the chase. And here's another case. This bowl was estimated at 600 to 800,000 Hong Kong, which is roughly 80 to 100,000 dollars. And it ended up selling for 7 million Hong Kong. So it sold for about 10 times its high estimate. All right. Um, did they know it probably would? I suspect they did. It was Jean D, all this other stuff. The seller obviously wanted to get out of it, and he also wanted a lot of competition for it. It was at the end of that enormous spike that occurred in the, the, the Chinese porcelain market around 2013, and um, they did it right. That's how you do it. That's how you get the money. And then there was this one. Um, this was earlier than that, 2008. It was estimated just two to 3,000 for this very nice pair of cafe uh, with blue interior kung chi bowls and ended up bringing $31,450. Again, 10 times estimate. And those things, these are from a few years ago, but you can find examples that happened just last year or the year before. It doesn't take much to go out and locate them. Um, here is a moon flask that sold. Now, this moon flask, the last time it was in an auction, it didn't sell in the auction and somebody bought it as a private treaty sale afterwards. All right. And here it is. It was estimated at 20 to 30,000 a few years later, sold for $45,220. I think this was, um, uh, about 20 years after it had been bought the last time it sold for that. So 45 million from 30, uh, 30, 30 million Hong Kong. It really jumped. And then you had some really big spreads like this one, uh, the Li Min Yang painting, um, letter to Yang Yi Ching. And uh, this was a Ming dynasty painting. Um, it was estimated at three to $500,000. It had lots of collector stamps on it and all that good stuff And at three to 500,000 Hong Kong. All right, which means it was it was estimated somewhere in the uh, uh, what does that come out to uh, thirty five to um, fifty thousand dollar range Hong Kong uh, currency, uh, which is thirty five to fifty thousand U S rather, and it ended up selling for twenty seven million six hundred thousand Hong Kong, or around um, um, uh, three point eight million dollars U S. So way over the estimate, way over the hundred times estimate. And then you had this, the Junyao uh, Ming Bowl, um, it was estimated at four to six thousand Hong Kong, uh, f four million to six million Hong Kong. Excuse me, it sold for fourteen million Hong Kong. And then you had this painting with s stamps from the Qinlung Emperor, and everybody in town owned this painting, I guess, throughout history. Uh, very, very interesting painting uh, of, of melons, uh, 16th century. Um, there's a whole history on this one. I remember it. There was a lot about the seals and so forth. It was estimated at three to 500,000 Hong Kong dollars. It sold for 5 million Hong Kong. A beautiful, beautiful picture. Again, Beautiful, historic, seals all over it from famous people. Famous collectors owned this that were known, that are written about, and it is an exquisitely attractive picture. And you add all that and then throw in an imperial seal of the Qinlung Emperor, even a partial one, and I think this is the case with this, it was partially uh, chopped out, um, 5.6 million Hong Kong or about uh, $650,000. And then you had this one, another painting, five to 800,000 Hong Kong, sold for 4.5 million and so forth. And that's the saga of it. That shows you how far it could be off. Um, you may have had cases in here where sellers um, uh, knew it would probably do very, very well. They had confidence in the market. They said, you just put a reasonable estimate on that thing and let it go. And these are the people that really, really do well because they drag that train behind them of lots of bidders, lots of people chasing it, excitement, a buzz, and uh, that's how you make money in the auction world. And, uh, I, I, and from my own experience, I can tell you that uh, um, I've uh, put things uh, with some of the big auction houses. And right off the bat, I tell them, I, you know, I'm not worried about reserves and I want you to keep the estimate low. All right. And I want you to encourage activity on this thing and um, pieces that we had sent to auction that were worth, you know, in the hundreds of thousands that were estimated, at, you know, we one sale I, we had a piece that we estimated we told the auctioneer estimated at 15 to 20,000 and um it had a, a, a 
pre pre uh, auction offer on it through the auction house of a hundred thousand U.S. and we turned it down, even though we paid just a few thousand dollars for it. And the reason was was that if somebody's willing to pay a hundred thousand pre auction, what are they willing to pay at the auction? And you knew the number was higher, and it was. It went it almost it went up by another fifty percent from there. All right, in the auction itself. But that is the power of of of, of setting smart reserves, smart estimates. And um, and going with it. And the other thing is, is that you you know you, the market will tell you what it's worth. It doesn't matter what anybody says it's worth. If you, if you have a comp on that day at that auction, if it was properly advertised and properly promoted, it brought every dime it was worth, and that's all there is to it. Maybe it wasn't worth what it used to be, but that's what it's worth now. And these are very important things to know. So check out some numbers, take a look at some of the auction sites and, and get a feeling for it. And uh, I hope you found this interesting. All right. Bye-bye.